Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third episode of our show. Tonight's panels are about leadership in crisis situations, specifically for events. On the first panel, we're going to talk about mistakes made and lessons learned. The second panel will explore adapting in the future. And of course, we'll also have Christopher Ambler on, the organizer, founder, and the non-chair of Constellation. We'll also have a reading by Karen. She'll read for us Garg and Moonslicer by you slash Wandering Bishop, which is kind of Reddit famous. With that, I'm Gadi Evron, and this is Essence of Wonder. On our first panel, we'll I'm gonna start that over as well. On our first panel this evening, we'll cover a number of mistakes made and the lessons learned. And as a result of those mistakes, what can we do differently? Joining me this evening are a number of people who have been in the position to lead when these mistakes were made. And in no particular order, I would like to introduce Vince Doherty, who will be leading this panel and moderating it, Patty Wells, Randall Shepard, Colette Fozard, Dave Kennedy, and Stephen Kellner. Before we do that, though, I would like to ask Vince and Chris Garcia to come in and talk to me for a minute here. Just to introduce our moderator and service for today. So, hello, Vince. How are you? Hi, Gary. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And Chris will be joining us as well in a second. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hello, Chris. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just cleaning up a little bit. <laughs> How many Hugo nominations have you had so far, Chris? 24? Uh, 24 Hugo nominations, two wins. So I'm one for 12 on average. So got Fair some enough. time to go. <laughs> well, Vince is going to st be stepping in for Esther, and you're going to be stepping in for your co-conspirator, James Bacon. And I appreciate that. Thank you again for doing this. And with that, I would like to uh, move forward and let Vince start his panel. Okay, thank you. And since... Uh... Chris brought in a prop. I, I also have a prop available as well, which is in, in James's absence. This is the uh, Dublin, a copy of the Dublin Hugo. So there you go. It's always good to have props. So thanks very much, Gaddy. I'm Vince Dorty. I'm uh, dialing in from The Hague in the Netherlands, where I live and work. Um, I've co-chaired two of the World Science Fiction Conventions in 95 and 2005 in Glasgow and worked in a, a whole number of other conventions over about 40 years, including in the last 10 years, where, for instance, the speed of change and social media has been, uh, become more and more influential. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists and ask them each to give a little bit of uh, introduction to themselves. So let's go to uh, Dave Kennedy. Um, Is Steve I'm on the line? Yep, this is Dave here. I'm the, uh, the CEO and founder of Trusted Second Binary Defense and also uh, the organizer that started uh, one of the co-founders uh, co of uh, DerbyCon, which uh, ran about nine years. Uh, so it started back in 2011. We just had our last DerbyCon uh, last year. Uh, it had over 3,000 people with sell tickets in 13 seconds. Uh, so really had a successful conference, successful run, and, and went through a lot of different growing pains as we kind of went through the different areas around uh, DerbyCon that we'll be talking about here uh, later on. Thanks very much. Over to Randall Shepard. Hi, I'm Randall Shepard, and I was the chair of the 71st Worldcon, which was in San Antonio, Texas in 2013. Um, the crisis angle was having to take over the organization about six months out from the convention. Thanks very much. Colette. I'm, uh, hi, I'm Colette Fazard. I was uh, brought in as one of the vice chairs for Worldcon 75 in 2017 in Helsinki, about 10 months out from the event. And uh, I'm also one of the co-chairs of next year's uh, Worldcon Discon 3 in Washington, DC. Thanks very much. And Patty Wells. Hi, I'm Patty Wells and I'm from Portland, Oregon, but I chaired the Worldcon in Reno in 2011 and have chaired several other conventions. But I think what's useful here is that I have been and I'm now again being a crisis counselor. Hmm. And Steve Kellner. Hi, I'm Steve Kellner. I'm a motivational psychologist by training who got into leadership assessment and development. I'm the president of Ascent Leadership Networks, which is in the business of developing top leaders to be better. Thanks very much. And my first question is to, uh, is to Dave, and that is, you know, can you give, an, can you give some details of the, uh, the kinds of crises that you faced as you uh, worked through your, uh, the years of running your uh, convention? Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we first started DerbyCon, uh, it, was, it was a relatively smaller size conference where, you know, we kind of had that family feel um, coming in, learning, uh, information security driven. 
And uh, what, what happened very quickly was that there was a really big need in the security industry for um, that type of conference where, where it was knowledge sharing. Uh, we, we had, a, if you go back historically, you know, before DEF CON got massive and large, um, you know, very much a, a tight knit group of people kind of sharing their experiences and things on like it. And it's definitely still, you know, that way today, just a massive on a massive scale. And, you know, what happened with DerbyCon is that, uh, you know, we threw a lot of really good conferences in a row and it just exploded in growth. So, so having, having to deal with the, the social media storm uh, that came along with it and then, you know, kind of the, the, the threats that kind of come in when you have different groups kind of, kind of hitting you at a given time. It's a, it's a very um, interesting time that we live in with conferences, um, with, with politics being involved, even if it's not a political conference, with, you know, um, uh, different social media groups, uh, you know, having specific interest in, in going after conferences. So for us, instead of having an actual incident, which didn't occur, we had to, you know, talk about a potential incident that might occur and what we would do to kind of address it. And, and so we learned a lot on, on how to respond to um, individuals um, to try to stay out of it for the most part, you know, personal things that happen outside of conferences don't necessarily relate directly into what is happening at the conference itself and what we do from a, a code of conduct perspective and how we uh, respond to specific incidents. Um, you know, we have an entirely dedicated uh, team of staff that, that help out with that. We have law enforcement that are that are there at all given times of the conference, and so you know, it was making sure that we had you know a good good story to tell around uh, attendees and, and what we're doing from an attendees' perspective. So that's that's interesting because you am I right in saying that you had a you know you had an organization that was essentially running from year to year or event to event uh, with a largely the same people or a core that was the same. It, it, it would change. So, you know, with DerbyCon, um, it, it, it would sell out in, in we'd, we'd sell out 3000 tickets in 13 seconds. And, you know, it, so the, 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 the capacity that we had was, was not there. So we, we could have probably grown it to 5,000, mm -hmm. you know, or not, or, or larger very, very easily, but we wanted to keep kind of a, a smaller size conference and have the same type of, of feel that we wanted to do. So I would say a lot of the core uh, people were there year to year and we were known as very much a, a family type of con, you know, uh, you know, uh, more of a, uh, um, a relaxed environment where everybody's trying to learn. Um, new people can come to the to the conference and learn from from other individuals, and so it was more of like a, a really friendly, open conference uh, for for anybody out there. And you know, when we first started DerbyCon, uh, it, you know, we started it uh, in, in 2011, I think, was our, our first DerbyCon, and uh, might have been 2010. But uh, you know, we, when we first started, we we wanted to get about 300 or 400 people, and the first year we got 1,100 people. And then from there, you know, it kind of exploded to 2,000 and 3,000. We kind of grew out of our space and just kind of wanted to keep it consistent. So year after year, we really had to morph and change the conference. And it was just more of a, a fun thing that we wanted to do as friends. And it turned into more of a, uh, a complete undertaking where it took, you know, 12, 12 months of planning. As soon as we finished it, we kind of, we take like two weeks off and then we start planning again uh, mm -hmm. to go through all of it. And, uh, you know, it became overwhelming and overloading with the amount of, of, of things that we had to do. And then on top of it, having to deal with, you know, political issues, you know, and we're not a political conference, you know, we're all about, you know, computer security, which you wouldn't think politics and things like that would bleed into um, conferences when you get social gatherings of people um, happening, that becomes an issue. You get, um, you know, people that dislike one another and that, that spouts out into social media and it just creates this kind of mob-like mentality, um, you know, uh, against the conference. So it's, it's a really weird um, dichotomy that we have to be in today um, in conferences because we're kind of meshed into all of these different areas of, of social gatherings and people that don't really get along with one another. So would I be right in saying that both, there would be a core of your organizing team that moved from event to event, and you had a core attendees, group of attendees, um, who probably had expectations, you know, that they, they, they were bought into, because I think there's a good link here to the other events represented. So the, the World Science Fiction Convention, of course, which is unusual in some respects for its size, that it moves from, place to place each year and the committee changes each year, although there, there is a tendency for a, a kind of core to often be involved. Um, going over to Ran Randall, I mean, you, you mentioned in your uh, intro about having to come in relatively late in the organization to take over the chairing of the, 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 the Texas, the San Antonio World Science Fiction Convention in 2013. Um, which of course has a, a core group around it and had run world cons before, but you had to come in with a specific uh, uh, focus and a, and a relatively short time to make things work. What, what were your observations about the, the, the kind of challenges in terms of managing the crisis? The part of the crisis was there were co-chairs that were not getting along as the short version. 
but then that bled out into the rest of the organization and there were divisions that kind of supported one or another, but mostly all of them were unhappy. And that uh, made people delay projects. And in fact, upon coming in or investigating the need to have a change, discovered it was covering up bigger problems. Budgets were way behind. Uh, there was a financial risk at the moment of stepping in. Uh, so it's, it was bigger than just the crisis point that drew me into it. Mm -hmm. But what were the elements of, if you, if you think about, uh, you know, if, you, if you're taking over the, you know, the driving of the train or the plane or the car, wh which levers did you choose to pull? And in particularly, what were the ones that were focused internally versus to the, to the membership as a, as a whole, with all of their expectations, of course? First, getting out a good, confident public message. And then it was key to get to know each one of the divisions. And even though you, you still have to be yourself, different people want different things from you. Um, mm -hmm. Some want to know it's just okay and then get on with their work. Some want you to come in and see what they're doing and, you know, give your blessing to it. Um, some would just want the show of confidence. Uh, there were people that until they got to know me were probably hesitant to, they did not bring staff in because the environment was so toxic. And then shortly got to the point where they go, okay, well, now I'm going to bring people in. I, I let my friends volunteer on this before I wouldn't. So. Mm. So if I kind of drew the question to the kind of like broad range of things you had to deal with over a kind of year. If we think about crisis response, as I recall in 2013, there were a couple of specific areas. I think there was one thing around that blew up very quickly, which of course happens nowadays with uh, social media. Uh, you probably recall there was a particular um, a film that had a troubled past, shall we say. Uh, maybe if, if we move then to the very specific about the importance of you know, the systems you had in place to respond quickly. Uh, well, we had uh, good marketing and social media um, boosting that up, paying attention to stuff and having good marketing, get the message out that there was a, the game had changed, everything was looking good. And I know the film you're, you're, you're talking about, that was a case of it appeared before, but just because it appeared somewhere before was not the answer mm -hmm. and without objection, never been noticed. But the program team is so large and has so many program items. And since it had been run without objection before, it goes in there and as the chair, the upper echelon of the organization, you can't know every single thing that's gonna happen. But when that blew up, we gave an immediate response of, hey, that's not gonna run. Look, the, the program's not finished. There's lots of eyes on it. There was no official blessing for that. And- Oh, did we lose uh, Randy there? I believe his video got stuck, but Zoom again has been very glitchy today. We can get back to okay. you. When you... So we can move on to the next person for now and Randy will be back. Okay. So building on the idea of responding to something that's very time dependent, you know, in, a, in, in the in social media response, of course, time is vitally important. Uh, can, can I go over to Colette, who a, a lawyer, primary focus now is co-chairing next year's World Science Fiction Convention in DC. You, you have had some experience over a few years, whether in, uh, well, any number, I'm sure you can talk about, but can you, can you speak to responding to a crisis, for instance, like with Ossicon this year, or in Helsinki or London or Dublin, any, any examples? And, and what are the key things that, need, that, that uh, an organizer needs to have in their skill set? I think uh, one of the best examples uh, that I had was um, from Dublin 2019 is uh, when the issue came up of the cha of the technical challenges with the closed captioning of the Hugo ceremony. Uh, I ended up being the uh, member of the facilitation division uh, that was sort of on duty that night. So when our uh, convention chair, James Bacon, sort of like came out of the ceremony and started to focus on, okay, what's the reaction? What are people saying? What, what do we need to do? Um, I mostly, you know, facilitation, we, we essentially uh, worked quite a bit to support the chair throughout. 
Uh, and so I basically tried to sort of, uh, you know, set up an environment for him, for him to be able to get the resources he wanted, help him to get the, 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 his questions answered, and then give him space to be able to sort of think through, consult with who he wanted to, and then make a decision for what he was going to do. Because uh, the steps on that were, okay, this is a problem. The decision was made to end, to, to just stop the, um, the closed captioning. And then uh, he brought in some of his um, promotions team to draft a statement uh, where I, you know, I was able to get it up uh, fairly immediately on the convention's blog. So, so that's sort of one example where, you know, in, 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 in a role, it's helpful to know, okay, what can I do to help sort of the decision maker in this, in this crisis? Um, you know, going a little bit to Randy's experience, when I came into Worldcon 75, about 10 months out as a vice chair, um, you know, the, the, the running joke was that I had gotten, you know, assigned uh, you know, most of, you know, what were considered the problem child divisions, you know, they were the ones that like, we, we think that these divisions have the most challenges, so you get them, Colette. And mostly what I did was I just, I set time to talk with each one of them. And then I mostly just tried to figure out, okay, what help do they need to get back on track? You know, for some people, we just got somebody in to help, to help tech manage them on a technical basis uh, for one division. We got them an ex, a, ver, a highly experienced co-division head, you know, and get them in place. And then, and then just sort of identifying the strengths and weaknesses of each division head. And then, you know, working with them to determine what support they needed. Sometimes they just needed their question answered. And then they're like, oh, I get it now. And then they would go off and they would be great. So I think we'll be coming back to a couple of elements you picked on there, but I'd like to go over to Patty. So, Patty, you, you're a long-term convention organizer in your, uh, in your home town and state, but you ended up running the World Science Fiction Convention in, in Reno, which is uh, some distance and some number of states away, uh, w with a combination committee. Um, what, 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 if we think about the kind of leadership aspects that you need to bring to it, both in kind of like the, the continuing leadership, but also any crises you had to face, what, what were the things that you recall were you know, either important that you knew beforehand and that you'd built in or that you learned in response to crises? Well, the first thing is that actually chairing it out of my hometown was easier because I could go to people that weren't necessarily local. And there might have been in Portland, Portland is a great city, but one or two people that would have been offended if in a Portland Worldcon they had not gotten a position. Where in Reno, where there was no fandom and that was very deliberately, deliberately done, people were pretty happy. As to crises, we were pretty lucky because 2011 mm -hmm. was the year that Twitter was still a toy and it wasn't mm -hmm. being used so purposefully. Um, but what we did have happen is realize that you can't communicate clearly enough during a crisis. Short and things that you thought were terribly obvious. Right before I was to teach a very complicated Excel class on formulas, I found out that Charlie Brown of Locus had died, who was going to be one of our guests of honor. Um, and it was the toughest class I ever taught in 20 years. Mm. But we talked afterwards of people would write immediately and go, are you going to replace him? And no, because with his position in Locust, he absolutely deserved to have been a Worldcon guest and wanted to be. But when we put it up on the website, we didn't, and when we got the bid, we didn't say that he'd passed away because we didn't think we needed to. We thought everybody knew that. And I don't know how many messages I got asking me if I knew Charlie had died, mm. but it was a lot. And I realized that no, we hadn't been absolutely clear of putting it up there that he was the guest of honor in memoriam. Mm. 
Um, and that actually solved the problem. It was just a matter of making sure that you've thought through all of the, the clearest communication you can get. Thanks. And Steve, I'll come to you in a moment. I just wanted to make a couple of observations from my own uh, experience, which I was planning to, to do. So in the, the 95 Worldcon in Glasgow, very much pre a lot of the social media that we have now by some way, although email and websites were just coming into uh, use then. Uh, on the Friday of that event, a famous author died at the convention, John Brunner. And then you, we had to deal with all of that. Now, pre pre-social media that was very much how do you deal with it over you know with a group of 5,000 people and how do you deal with the emotions associated with that and in that case it was a, about bringing in another person in that case Robert Silverberg to actually lead a kind of eulogy for him at the uh, at the Hugo ceremony and uh, that was very interesting to see because by, by creating that focus it also created a focus for the emotions of everybody who was there which I think is probably common regardless of the speed of response in the social media although it, it, you do need to be faster in response. Um, in working in a number of world cons in the last decade it has become clearer that speed is important and clarity of who gets to respond and who shouldn't respond which is most of the uh, the, the committee who are outside the core team and and building the, the kind of like muscle in the organization to to do that is is actually a key leadership attribute and so steve coming over to you Reflecting on what you've heard, what, what would, are your observations about, you know, the, if we focus on leadership ability in managing a crisis, what, what are the points that you would, uh, you would pick up? So people have pulled a couple of common points here. And one is that, of course, crises are fast by definition, and they're also uncertain by definition. So it's like, how do you deal with the fact that you, you know, as one person pointed out, you can't make decisions um, with all the information because you don't have all the information. Um, then one of the points I think was Colette, I know Patty said, you cannot communicate clearly enough. And one thing I think uh, you haven't mentioned, but I'm going to guess you did was you communicated when you didn't know everything, meaning communicate that you don't know everything. Would that be fair? And that this is what we know. Actually, we find that when people say what they don't know or what we're still deciding, that actually helps increase the clarity that people understand too. Um, but you know, you're gonna have to move fast. You're gonna have to make decisions. And then the question is, you know, trying not to overstep, I think is what some people were saying, the, you know, the reality of what's going on. Politics are not new. I mean, the very mm -hmm. first World Con had significant politics. It was just slower reaction time. Um, so, and, and I think then you also raise a point of emotion. So we've got a mm -hmm. situation that's happening fast, is very uncertain and is gonna hit people's hot buttons. So I think it's a question of being responsive to people, communicating so they get it, or at least they mm. get what you know, and doing it as quickly as possible. Did, did that mm. make sense? I mean, I think those are some of the, there's a lot more than what people said, but I mean, those are sort of the things that leaped out at me. Yeah, indeed. And uh, I understand, Randall, you're, you're back on the, the line. Let, let me just give you the chance to finish your train of thought. I don't know if you've, how much of the recent conversation you've uh, heard, but uh, any further points you would like to make before, we, uh, before I move on? Um, well, I don't know how much of the, the movie response, but I, the speed of responding and apologizing and clearing the matter up um, and closing it was, was key. Um, just since I've got the platform, I think another thing that was important to me, at least for leadership, was having um, several confidants, mm -hmm. somebody that you know will come and speak to you, straight shooter, cold turkey, here's the blunt truth, that other people might be afraid to come up and tell you. Um, I benefited that from several people that would, would do that, and I treasured it. It was really, really valuable. Several people kind of made the point that you shouldn't be making this all by yourself. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and, uh, and I believe everyone on the panel, uh, certainly who are the convention organizers, are all doing it in addition to their, their day job. So, you know, uh, um, Steve, thing, I'm sure you were aware, you know, the list of the, what is it, the top 10 things that can impact you in life. You know, if you're running something the size of some of these events, you can pretty much add that to those other things as well, you know, like relationships and moving house, etc. Um, I, so, I think it's a great point, Vince, and we should add to it the sense of size and scope, because David talked hmm. about how 
the organization kind of grew beyond their ability to manage it in a comfortable way. And knowing your limits is going to be key. Mm -hmm. Size and scope can completely drown people. Mm -hmm. And all the more reason why you need a team who knows what they're doing and, and or mm -hmm. knows where to stop. Well, I, think Randy, that, I think that was, oh, was it you, sorry, Dave. Yeah, yeah go ahead. That's kind of our big issue at DerbyCon was, you know, when we first started the conference, it was, you know, my wife, it was a couple of my friends and we just decided to go mm -hmm. and start this, you know, in a, in a, in a hotel uh, area and, and, you know, and it's exploded into being kind of a core pillar of the information security industry. And, you know, and when it was first us, you know, we were the front facing people of the conference itself, which I think was a lot of where we ran into a lot of our problems where it wasn't us coming out consistently as a voice. You had different organizers really causing confusion, including myself, um, you know, commenting on a specific thing or one would be upset, you know, as we're getting attacked on social media, the other one will lash out and, and causing all this uh, uh, chaos that really didn't need to be there. And, and having one unified voice um, as a conference, instead of having a face of the conference um, be the, the direct communication path, I think was really where we messed up pretty heavily um, in how we responded. And we definitely learned from that. You know, uh, you know we, we very much you know, came together more as an organization and became you know, more of a, a central voice for how we communicate things. But you know, I, I do really agree with what Randall said on, you know, people wanna get the information out fast. They wanna understand what's happening. Uh, and and you, you can be cool to say, hey, we don't know all the details yet, but we're investigating, we're working on this. And, and people recognize that, you know, when you're, when you're in a crisis situation, and, and this is in security too, when you're dealing with incident response, you know, the, the facts and the details come as, as you're doing the investigation um, of something. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, um, we had an individual uh, a couple of years ago um, that was, uh, it was a, a, a woman that was being targeted by a, a man in the conference itself, uh, kind of got mm -hmm. aggressive with her at a, at a, a party. And, you know, we didn't know what, what exactly was happening. Uh, law enforcement was involved where they, we, we already had law enforcement there. The, the, the woman was, was safe and everything, but we had to go back and kind of track back who the individual was, where it actually occurred at, you know, who this individual was so we can remove him from the conference. And as that was happening, you know, social media, of course, is going crazy. Um, and so, you know, we responded back with one unified voice and we're investigating, you know, blah, blah, blah. We've been in contact with the individual that was, you know, affected by this. And, 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 and after the fact, you know, we, we removed this person from the conference. And so, you know, that, that works really well from a, a streamlined response of how we actually handled the situation. I think we were much more prepared, you know, as we kind of grew up, I guess, as a conference. Um, but the initial stages when we first started off was, was pretty rocky because we were just mm -hmm. going from, you know, hey, just a couple of friends trying to throw a conference in a big party to, you know, a, a massive conference with all these people coming together that, that's now kind of a staple of, of an industry. So, you know, you, you, you have to be able to change. You have to be able to, to uh, know when, you need to grow. And I think to Steve's point, you know, there's, there's a point in time where you either decide, you know, it's, it's not for us anymore to do. And that's what we ultimately ended up deciding at DerbyCon was, it's just too much work for us, or you pass it off to people um, to, mm -hmm. to, you know, really grow the conference and build it out the way that it needs to grow uh, in a certain way. So, so in terms of the decisions that you had to make, and the, I think that's, I'm going to move to that, you know, decisions that we need to make either in response to an external attack or circumstance or you know to take the the title of the, the of the of the panel mistakes we've made well sometimes mistakes that shall we say political leadership in certain countries make that cause a certain uh uh re require a certain response in your case you made the call to stop i think is that correct yeah that's correct and, we decided to stop after, after nine years yeah okay and and what what were the you know describe the the reason for that and how it felt both before and after the the you know when we when we, when we first started the conference it was really to to be a place where we could get together as friends share research um, share industry knowledge tech, techniques and things like that and you know we wanted to keep it kind of a, a tight-knit family community type of conference and that that really changed when you know you sell out tickets in 13 seconds you can't you can't mm -hmm have a conference like that. And, and that, that's a testament to, hey, we, we, we ran a really good conference. I'm not complaining about that in any way, shape or form. Um, but, but it really changed uh, with, with how we were doing it. So the workload that we had to do, you know, it really consumed. It, it, it was less of a, a side job. It was more so a real job of what we were doing. Our, our time commitments that we put into that was, was literally consuming at least eight months of our lives um, mm -hmm. you know, of getting everything kind of organized, orchestrated, put together. And it, it just became less and less fun for us each and every year. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, you know, you start getting these social media people that are going nuts and crazy on you um, each and every year, same group of people all the time. And, and that's kind of demotivating in, in how you do things. And so I think, 
you know, the, the, the amount of work that we put in for, you know, what was actually happening and what we were actually doing, uh, it just became too much for us to kind of manage. And, and we, it wasn't taken lightly. We had been contemplating it for a couple of years and, you know, we all kind of sat down at the end of, of, of DerbyCon 8 and, um, you know, we weren't going to go out and that wasn't, that wasn't going to be our final one, but I think we were all just mentally and physically exhausted with the amount of work that we had put into it. And, and then we just said, you know, listen, this, this isn't fun for us anymore. Uh, you know, it's time for us to, you know, consider this our last one. What does everybody think? And everybody was in the same boat. Mm-hmm. You know, we all kind of felt overwhelmed. And I think it, you know, at that point it was, a uh, we had waited too long, uh, to switch over to something like to pass it off to more people to, to organize. We were already at that point where we were over the edge of, of mm-hmm. the conference itself, where we were kind of just done with it. And we were kind of done with the amount of effort and work. And we we're just going to do one more, make it an awesome conference, uh, and, and, and kind of go out, go, go out in a, in a highlight. And, you know, DerbyCon 9 was probably our best DerbyCon that we've ever had. It was perfect, ran seamless, no incidents. You know, it was great. It was, it couldn't have gone any better. And, uh, you know, you, you look at that DerbyCon 9, you're like, man, why can all these conferences uh, run this way? Because we had a lot of fun, but it was also a lot of fun because we knew it was our last one. And uh, okay. I'll yeah. tell you, this year, I've had so much more time with my kids and my family and doing other side projects. So it's been, it's been kind of a godsend. So, yeah. And I think that, I think that's important, particularly when we're doing this as uh, volunteers, you know, cause uh, you know, in the last decade, again, I mean, we, we've seen from a Worldcon perspective, you know, challenges just growing and growing, whether it's the, you know, individual responses to individual issues that come up and often around the Hugos, the big attack on the Hugos by a number of, uh, uh, shall we say out, outside factors and of course coming to uh, this year uh, and again coming back to Colette maybe a question to you um, you know the biggest decision I think in recent memory for Worldcon is to switch from being uh, at relatively short notice from being an in-person convention to a virtual convention and 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 the kind of you know wh- wh- what does that do to the committee and staff and what do you need to do as a leader of that organization to help them work through that not not a small question i guess but <laughs> colette uh, can you give some insight into that from an inside perspective well uh i in addition to the other Worldcon work I've done, I'm one of the division heads for this year's Worldcon Con Zealand, which, as you mentioned, did go virtual. And I will be upfront in that I respect our uh, leadership, uh, Norman Gates and Kelly Bueller, very much for, you know, coming to that decision, uh, for, for thinking about it. They brought in uh, one of the things, again, is that they, you know, the discussion started within what's called the executive group, the, um, the chairs and the vice chairs, and then, then they brought in all of us division heads uh, to, to sort of go over it and just say, you know, we, we really think this is the direction we're going to go in. What are your thoughts? And I think it was a very good discussion. Uh, they, you know, they got some input and some perspective that they helped with uh, the decision. And also, I think for them, knowing that we supported that decision, uh, because, you know, they did take a polling vote, you know, within Zoom, and, you know, it was a unanimous support for the decision among the, uh, the division heads. And, again, when you talk to the human factors of it, uh, you know, I think that helped, like, I, I had not totally realized this, but, you know, bringing Worldcon to New Zealand was a 10 year effort. And, you know, through, you know, sort of really active bidding, I think back at the last AussieCon in 2010, you know, through to, you know, you know the, the vote in 2018 and such. And so, you know, I, we had to respect the, 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 the human side of the emotion um, in that, uh, you know, I certainly sort of like tried to, you know, you know, look at, you know, Kelly and Norman and just give them some time to mourn, you know, give them Mm. some time to be like, you know, this is, this is going to be different. This is going to not be what I had a vision for so long. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to their credit, I think they, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're still working to find somewhat of a balance of, okay, we need some time to mourn. But then they've also worked for, on like, okay, we need to move forward with, you know, the platform decisions, the, um, you know, how are we going, you know, reaching out to all of the divisions to find out, okay, what, what which of your activities can move smoothly online, what, 
what experiences can you recreate? And so, and then, you know, so we, you know, we all kind of had our moment of, ooh, well, you know, wow, this is a big change. But then they, I think they did well in sort of continuing to move us forward of, okay, now we need to figure out how to make the best concealing we can when, you know, not all of us are going to be in Wellington, New Zealand, like we, like we mm. had all hoped. Yeah, and, and the question was partly uh, based on a, a question that Kelly, who's actually in, the, in this webcast, uh, hi Kelly, was asking about how, you know, you keep the committee on side when you can't answer all their questions due to time constraints. And of course, the general point of, of all the events that we've spoken about is that they're volunteer events. You know, it, it's not like we are all paid staff. I mean, that would be great if it was, but it's, we're, we're not. You know, people are really only motivated by, you know, fundamentally the, the commitment that they've got to what their contribution to the event. But I think Kelly's question was a very important one, especially where there is such a major decision to be made in a short time, where you have to keep the committee on side. And I think that I think that's a point I'd like to build on. And there's, after this, I'm going to move over to risk management. But um, coming to uh, Patty and, and then to, to Steve again, if you think about um, the, the leadership capacity or support you need in a crisis situation, having heard these these recent examples, do you have any further observations or you know approaches that you think are important? So, Patty, again, thinking about, you know, both your local convention experience and, and Reno and also seeing what's happened in the last 10 years. What are those, um, you know, leadership uh, capabilities that you really, really need to have or get and or get support for? Uh, so, Patty, you can the go ahead. For leadership is to look up and say, what can I communicate? and communicate it reassuringly because i think people are looking for leadership mm. and if you write things that are short and clear and fairly frequent and say we know we don't have all the answers but this is the progress as for the support um i know that i was faced with two or three decisions that I just needed, instead of division heads going, well, I think we should do this, somebody to give me a report that laid out the positive and negative factors objectively. This will cost this, this other option will cost that, and give me something that was clear so that I wasn't have to, having to go pull out information. But the clarity of communication all the way through is the thing that I'll keep saying over and over again. Oh, and back on the um, Kelly's question about how you keep people on your, on your side with all of this, um, I'm a big person for saying thank you. It's a very simple thing, but I had one convention I worked on for a very hard, very long time and didn't get said thank you to at any point during it. And after that, I always remembered to say thank you to people and thank them for what they'd done so that they knew it wasn't just kind of a meaningless throw off. Mm. Absolutely. Steve, your observations so far. Yeah, well, you've all raised some of the most critical points. And, and um, I mean, any leader has to be able to keep people engaged. But in volunteer organizations, it's 10 times as hard because everyone feels like they get to pass judgment on the organization. So it's not a case of, look, I'm paying you, do it my way or quit. It's everyone feels that if, if you make a decision that isn't in line with their values, then they are mm -hmm. entitled to comment and demand differences. So the way to counter that, and Patty, is, I think you're absolutely right, of course, is that you can communicate what you know and communicate that there are things you don't know. And as a communication of lack of clarity increases clarity. I, I know it's paradoxical, but there's actually research on this. Um, there's another point that was raised around organizing information and organizing the communication and the discussion. Having a big wad of people all trying to make a decision is great for democracy. It's very bad for getting decisions done quickly. Um, but studies have shown that even it, no matter what size the team, somebody is acting as a leader if it's effective. Mm. It doesn't have to be the same person, not even all the time. So uh, someone to organize and 
sort to Patty's point, the conceptual thinking is actually a characteristic we look for, where you can focus on what's the most important thing to know now, what's mm -hmm. the pattern of, uh, as you put it, I think the, the positives and the negatives. Um, that's all really key. And being respectful people because that's a positive reinforcer for the volunteers. It's like, I respect everything you're saying. I don't know everything. Here's what I do know. I need you to work on this piece and I need you to work on this piece. Um, and um, to the point, I think it was Colette made that, that the discussion started in the core team and then went down to the larger team. So you spent some time mm -hmm. making sense of what you were going to do before you opened it up to wide open discussion. And that's a way of making sure that it doesn't just become a free for all where the noisy people get most of the airtime that you already had a proposal in hand, which then people could respond to. You were limiting the number of possible answers. And that's something I see great leaders doing all the time. Okay. Very good. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. So there's one, there's one point I want to introduce and go background and this may be your, each of you the last opportunity in this particular conversation. For the most part, we've been talking about responses, reactions to something that's happened either internally or externally. And in organizations that are for the most part just brought together for a period of time and then disband, there isn't the, the opportunity that you would have, say, in a, in a standing like a corporation, for instance, which is a permanent organization, to actually get people to assess risks in advance scenario plan them and actually get to practice some of them whether that is you know you know the, there are famous cases in fandom as well you know the, the, the zukon game i think some people are familiar with but you know that it's far better to prevent something than to mitigate it afterwards and we've mostly spoken about how you react and and the, the kind of leadership capacity you need to do that in your organization but let, let's go around again and just have a little bit and this may be a good segue to the later conversation what is it whether you're in a voluntary organization or in a permanent one that you can actually do to kind of build that muscle so that you're you're a stronger more resilient organization for when the risks actually come to pass. And again, let, let me go back to, uh, to Dave, you know, that was at the nine years of your convention, you had a, a core committee, it's, I guess some things you built the muscle by doing, but were, were there opportunities to actually anticipate um, and that you would actually try to get people maybe to do a run through or a practice session? Yeah, what, absolutely. Whatever. Yeah, absolutely. We, we actually incorporated um, security training for all of our personnel um, each and every year. We did that um, around DerbyCon 3. Uh, where all of our staff would actually go through um, uh, formalized training, uh, response criteria. Uh, we had, um, a, you know, a, a established code of conduct of how we would respond to specific incidents. Uh, we'd also communicate to the hotel staff of how to address certain things, um, you know, to help educate them, even though they did a pretty, pretty good job um, at doing it. You know, having law enforcement in place was also a great area. Um, but also, I think a unified communication uh, strategy was really important in making, you know, to the point of making decisions as a leader you know, having a, a clear person that is handling the communication piece of, of certain um, incidents that are happening, but also uh, getting ahead in front of it uh, to be able to communicate what the conference is doing uh, around safety and security, uh, what they're doing as far as, you know, how the conference is going to be scheduled and, and run. Um, so people coming to the conference um, have clear expectations of what's occurring. I think um, all of that really made um, made a big difference in our, in our future um, in, engagements of, of how we de uh, dealt with uh, specific incidents and really prepared our teams to be able to handle those pretty, pretty res uh, respectively. You know, when you deal with any type of, of incident response scenario, especially in security, you know, we have this, this concept called tabletop exercises where, you know, you run through playbooks, you run through situations where um, you get people involved uh, of, of how to handle certain situations. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, your, your staff are, are volunteer staff that are helping the conference run um, and, and may not be appropriately trained to handle certain situations. So having escalation criteria of people that are actually trained to be able to facilitate that, um, people that specialize in um, you know, medical, for example, if there's a medical incident versus a security incident and how to get to those people um, in a quick fashion and, and really uh, make it work in, in a clear way is, is really, really important to, to have well organization around that to minimize any time um, of a specific incident. Um, all of that worked, worked really well for us as we had it. You know, what's interesting is that you know, a lot of our, our challenges really, really wasn't at the conference level inside the conference. We, we ran that very, very well. Our, our, our amount of incidents were extremely low. The attendees were usually really great. Granted, you know, we had, you know, drunk folks and we had established protocols. So if it was a woman, you know, you would have a woman person getting up to the room, you know, a, a minor, you know, with two people in place. 
Um, you know, those types of situations you kind of learn from and you grow from. It's just when you start getting, you know, a lot of outside influence into the conference and creating a lot of chaos and, and kind of uh, pandemonium, that's, that's usually when, you know, our communication really broke down. So, and that, that's what we learned a lot from, from that specific side. So, you know, going through tabletop exercises, running through those teams, going, going through training uh, really made a big difference uh, for us. Dave, thank you very much. So, so coming back for the for a final pass through the, those who've been working on the World Science Fiction Convention, and again, how, how you how each separate committee builds that capacity, and I guess possibly a link to the later panel as we think about you know institutional memory that gets passed down. You know, if, if you're the same convention in the same city each year, that's kind of built in. But when you're a convention like the World Science Fiction Convention or SMOFCON or World Fantasy or the British National Easter Con, for instance where it's a different committee each year, you, th that, that can be difficult as well. So coming to, uh, uh, to Randall, uh, you know, any observations in terms of how you actually build that, you know, how, how you prepare in advance for st stuff happening um, in order to be ready for it? Well, it helps having veteran members from previous committees come on. And you mentioned earlier that there is a kind of a floating committee that moves the world cons. There are a lot of the same faces involved. As Dave was saying, having everything set and in place so that people knowing you've got a code of conduct following, so you knowing you have an emergency response team, knowing that you've got a plan in place when those things come up to build a confidence level that it'll all run smoothly and they don't have to be sitting there worrying. And I always tried to keep in mind um, the added pressure that as much as the world cons in an annual event, the event that I was running was once off. There wasn't a redo. We didn't get to do it over next week. Uh, there wasn't any punting it down the road. It had to go off then and not to worry about it, but you should let that be a, a focusing motivation. At least it was for me um, to make sure we got it done right and on budget and everybody had a fun time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and hopefully you all did. I was there and it seemed to go pretty well. So uh... it did. And in fact, and that's something I tell people a lot working on this it's, often when you see a sad face or tense is as much as this is hard work and, and it shouldn't be necessarily so much fun, the behind the scenes stuff. If you're not having some fun doing it, um, yeah. there's a problem and that, that needs to be yeah. fixed. And of course, it's much easier to run a world con the second time than the first time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. yeah, no comment. Anyway, coming to, uh, to Colette again, the same question, thinking of the different organizations you've been in, um, that whole point around, you know, building capacity to, to respond to things before they happen, you know, being, you know, an important thing that you want to build in a, in, in a team or an organization. And especially where you have some degree of institutional memory, of course, whether it's people that are moving across all of them. And, and any examples where you think we got it really well done or, uh, or not? I think uh, Dublin 2019, I think, did an excellent job organizing a, internally a lot of the information to be able to support staff and have very clear uh, instructions for you know, what would happen if a, uh, you know, if, if there was suddenly a Twitter storm or something uh, and uh, mm. information like that. And certainly one of the things that I've tried to do, knowing that I was going to be having, you know, hopefully, uh, but now confirmed, uh, DISCON 3 coming up next year, is working on various other world cons to sort of gain the experience uh, to sort of see what some of the common themes are, you know, no understanding that it's a different city, you know, major, uh, major, uh, majorly a different committee each year. But there are recurring themes. There are, you know, okay, this is always going to be an issue. Here's how we can address it. And then also, I won't lie, I've had the, um, uh, I've, you know, gone to the various groups and just picked out the people uh, who I, I, you know, felt were, were excellent in their jobs and just said, and you just went to them and just say, hey, you did a really great job here. Can I get you to do X for me? And uh, I mean, fortunately, you know, we've been, uh, our recruiting has been very strong with that. Uh, but if you, you just put a good team in place that you trust, uh, that uh, that can bring a lot of, you know, a sense of comfort, or certainly as a, as a leader of an event, to just say, okay, I trust them, 
for you know pretty much everything and i trust if the, if it is beyond them i trust them to alert me and or and i trust them to say hey we're handling this but here's a heads up that this might you know that this might blow up and i'm like okay all right thank you mm. so indeed and building on that coming to uh to Patty again, both from a specific, but also in terms of coaching um, the leaders of conventions and other organizations. You know, what, 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 are, the, what are the elements that you would uh, make sure that they knew about in, re in regards to managing a crisis, both you know, preventing and also rea reacting to it? Well, in terms of preventing one, you need to have enough staff. The biggest single failing I've seen with any convention is long about the last day of the convention when there wasn't enough staff and no one's had sleep and then you make mistakes. Mm. And particularly moving to something like a world con and this is something that happened to me in, at our first Western con in Portland that no one had stopped to say that doing a two and a half day Oricon was different from doing a four and a half day Westercon. And by that fourth day after a crisis happened, um, everybody was going through serious sleep deprivation. But reminding anybody that's going from a local world, a local con to a world con that you got to have more people, you got to have the sleep, you mm -hmm. have to be ready to know that something may happen on that last night and somebody's still got to be fresh enough to deal with it. Yeah. You raise a great point and you know I would say you know I would always think about you know the, the care element both self-care as care for others you know the self-care you know like on a plane you know put your own oxygen mask first uh, before you can help anyone else you know you can't help anyone else if you're completely out of it, you know, and, and sleep deprived, et cetera. So the self-care and then care for others and also building that resilience and strength in an organization so that when the, you know, the slings and arrows come that, uh, uh, you know, that they're readier for it. I'm going to give uh, Steve the last, uh, the last word before handing back to uh, Gary. Well, you, you, Steve, your, your observations, um, very interested to hear as you think about it from your lens, from a kind of like leadership perspective. I mean, I, I guess if I summarized overall, what I'm hearing is that the leaders, the leaders on this call focus on a number of key things. One is you have to focus very, very clearly on what your objective is ahead of time. So you know what you're really trying to accomplish. Uh, and despite the chaos that might happen. Second, is there something here about being able to think and plan and prioritize both ahead of time, which gives you more brain time in the chaos, but also to be able to prioritize rapidly. And the third big component is you got to work with people. And that mm -hmm. includes leading through chaos and creating clarity, managing the team, which includes, as people said, recruiting the right people, um, assigning them the right tasks, delegating genuinely, and communicating to them constantly in order to keep people motivated. So that's sort of, you know, so there's the, the driving for the results, the planning and the people. And at one point that's come up over and over again is that experience really matters because if you, it's great to be smart and react fast, but it's better to have experience so you don't even have to think. Mm. And that means the people you bring or the people you could consult with. So I think that's a lot of what I've heard here. Hope that makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. And I would only add, you know, it's important to be kind to yourself and kind to others. Mm. Uh, you know, always, always start from that place and you'd probably be doing the right thing. I'd like to thank all the uh, panelists, Kat, Colette, Patty, Steve, Dave, and Randy. Um, thank the team, uh, Daria, and uh, let me hand it back to, uh, to Gaddy. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, first of all, thank ev thanks everybody and thank you, Vince. I would like to make a comment. I, I decided to keep myself out of this panel as there is such a huge variety of expertise here that I thought just let you, to let you people talk would be great. That said, mm -hmm. I did think about a couple of things as you were talking and I couldn't help but consider, of all things, Isaac Asimov, meaning starting with uh, psychohistory, we have a plan. Then, as we learned in cybersecurity over the past decade, no matter how much you prepare, 
eventually you're measured by, by, by how you act when something happens. So for example, the mule happened. Nobody planned for that. They had to respond somehow and bring the plan back um, to run smoothly. And therefore they had an instant response plan in place, which was the second foundation. And I just found as I do my job daily in cybersecurity that these examples of how to handle incidents and the various aspects of how you deal with things are, is pretty amazing for me personally. And the CEO of my own company, I often look at how I can communicate clearly and honestly, even about what I can't share. 